This chapter 2 explains how basic interest rate swaps and options can be used to reduce or eliminate interest rate exposure and how to explain the effect of such hedges by means of simple diagrams. We refer you first to this worksheet Pricing in which three-month LIBOR caplets and florlets are priced by means of a standard black model, a close cousin of the Black-Scholes model used to price simple equity and FX options. To refresh your memory, we call these options caplets and florlets because each option appearing in columns H and I is a European style cap or floor covering one single reset of three month LIBOR for one single future period. We will shortly combine these caplets and floorlets to produce the more traditional multiple period caps and floors that borrowers and investors use more typically. Note the assumptions appearing in this worksheet, namely that three-month LIBOR spot is 5% as stated previously, annualized vol is 15%, which is close to our 100 basis points used earlier and very importantly the fairly steep LIBOR spot and forward curve in column D. For now the strike is set at 6% which makes the caplets for the earlier periods out of the money forward and the later caplets in the money forward. We will work shortly with a variety of alternative strikes. To keep the worksheet simple, we treat each quarter as exactly one-fourth of one year, but we remind you that the correct convention for US dollar LIBOR is actual 360. One additional matter to note before proceeding is that for the caplet and florlet appearing in row 5, i.e. for the three-month period starting immediately, the time until the start appearing in cell C5 has been fudged a little, so to speak, to prevent it from becoming exactly zero Otherwise, a number of other cells would go crazy since they involve dividing by the entry in this cell C5. It should not surprise you that this caplet in H5 is shown to be worth zero since we know that with a LIBOR at 5% and a strike at 6%, this caplet is clearly out of the money and has no more time value by definition. By the same token, the first floorlet in I5 is not really an option at all, but represents the certainty of receiving in three months time the difference between 6% and 5% uh, 
applied to a notional of $100 million for one quarter and therefore $250,000. The premium that you see in I-5 of $246.9 thousand is nothing more than this guaranteed payoff in three months of 250,000 discounted for three months at 5%. There is one final tedious but important point to note about the discount factors in this column G. Obviously the entry of one that you see in cell G5 cannot be the discount factor for a cash flow occurring in the future. In fact it is the somewhat meaningless discount factor for a cash flow occurring right now which is needed for the general form of the formula for caplet and floralet prices in columns H and I. The number immediately underneath, namely 0 0.9877, is the discount factor for a cash flow occurring at the end of the first quarter and therefore each number below that is the discount factor for a cash flow occurring at the end of the next quarter. For the 20 consecutive caplets and floorlets we are pricing on this worksheet we do not need any other discount factors. But for the five-year swap priced in subsequent worksheets, we will in fact need one more discount factor which is why you will see in those subsequent worksheets an additional discount factor appearing in cell G25, although these cells may be hidden in most worksheets. If you decide to use this worksheet to price real-life instruments, please make sure you have understood this point perfectly. This next worksheet, GRID, shows, starting in column O, the prices of caps and, to the right, floors on US dollar three-month LIBOR, including, as you can see, five-year caps and five-year floors. In each case, with various strikes, that lie along the range of values we had shown earlier with our exposure diagrams. Prices are quoted in upfront basis points per unit of notional. These caps and floors have been priced by means of our previous worksheet pricing using a volatility of 15% for all strikes, which is not in fact how the market normally works. You will learn more on this topic when you study the concept of the volatility skew in one of our more advanced modules. But for now, please be aware that options having different strikes but otherwise identical terms are not normally priced using the same input for implied volatility. For example, caps that are at the money are often priced using 
a lower volatility assumption than caps that are far in the money to reflect the possibility of a big movement in rates under crisis conditions. We make a few observations first to assist your understanding of these pricing grids. First, note that we have hidden the columns where the individual caplet and floorlet prices originally appeared for the preservation of space. You should, however, unhide these columns and work your way through the formulas to confirm that you understand how each cap is priced as simply the sum of a number of caplets and each floor is also priced simply as the sum of a number of floorlets. Second, some very far out of the money caps and floors are shown here to cost zero, which is the correct mathematical result if we base this solely on the black cap pricing formula and on the stated terms of those caps and floors. In practice, of course, no rational dealer would ever sell any option on any asset or index for zero, no matter how far from the money it is. We also show some very expensive caps and floors to be as comprehensive as possible. In practice, many of these, since they are so far in the money, are unlikely to be of much interest to users. Finally, on this row 27, note that we have also indicated the swap rate for each maturity at the bottom of the, each grid which we will be referring to from time to time. The swap rates have been derived via an approximation you can see programmed in the relevant cells, which is highly accurate but not perfect, and which sets the swap rate equal to the sum of the PVs of the floating payments that would be made over the life of the swap divided by the product of the notional amount times the length in years of each settlement period times the sum of the relevant discount factors. Note importantly the five-year swap rate here of 5.90% which is 90 basis points higher than the three-month LIBOR spot rate. Easily explained by the upward sloping shape of the LIBOR curve. The pattern of prices should be entirely intuitive with caps becoming more expensive as the strike is lowered, floors becoming cheaper, and conversely when the strike is increased and the longer the coverage period of a cap or floor, the more it costs, obviously. 
thus a three-year cap must cost more than a two-year cap if we hold the strike constant and a five-year floor must cost more than a four-year floor again if we hold the strike constant. With these prices in front of you we proceed to examine the pros and cons of various hedging strategies for the floating rate loan exposure with which we began this module. The simplest hedge of all is probably the interest rate swap and specifically in the case of our borrower a five-year IRS which results in the company locking in a fixed interest expense of 6.9% annually for the entire life of the loan. Diagrammatically, at inception the company simply enters into the five-year swap contract on a notional of $100 million as depicted in this diagram for no upfront premium or other exchange of cash, ignoring any margining requirements imposed by the bank. Then on each settlement date, the company pays LIBOR plus 1% to the bank under the loan and receives an amount under the swap equal to LIBOR minus 5.9 percent which of course may be positive or negative depending on the actual LIBOR reset thus bringing the total annualized interest cost in all cases to 6.9 percent as appears on the bottom right of the slide. It will therefore be easily seen that the impact of the interest rate swap on the company's exposure, previously shown by this diagram, is to transform the diagonal into a simple horizontal of height 6.9% as shown here. The outcome, as with any forward or swap contract for any asset class becomes the same irrespective of the spot level of LIBOR on any reset date and the company may find itself paying either a higher over on the left or a lower amount of interest than it would have had if it had remained unhedged. The table appearing now describes the three generically distinct outcomes under the IRS for any future interest period compared to a decision to do nothing. Turning now to simple option-based hedges, we consider first the use of an ordinary five-year LIBOR cap struck at 7%, say, and the impact this has on the company's overall position. Remembering that the premium for this cap comes to 117 basis points up front. So in total around 1.17 million dollars given the 100 million dollar notional of the cap. We need to consider the two alternative outcomes where the option expires alternatively in and out of the money. These are discussed next. 
case one, if three month LIBOR is above the strike of 7% on any reset date, the company would exercise the cap, receive from the cap seller at the end of the interest period an annualized amount equal to LIBOR minus 7% and pay to the bank under the loan also at the end of the interest period an amount equal to LIBOR plus 1%. Combining these payments together gives rise to an annualized payment of 8% in effect equal to the sum of the strike plus the credit spread. We still need to include the CAPS premium to derive the all-in total cost of this financing structure but obviously cannot simply add the premium of 117 basis points which is the price of protection for all five years combined to the 8% annualized interest expense. We could as an approximation divide the upfront premium by five to derive the annualized cost of protection under the cap and then add that to the 8%. But a more accurate calculation would take into account the time value of money and is set forth on worksheet annualized premium. The main thing to observe about this worksheet is that it uses the same discount factors as were used to price the caps and floors to derive the annualized cost of the upfront premium by means of the goal seek function. Thus tools goal seek set cell D26 equal to value 116.5280 by changing cell C28 and then hit OK yields a value of 6.72 basis points for the quarterly cost of the cap here in cell C28 and hence four times as much annually i.e. just about 27 basis points to the nearest basis point. Now for case two. If three month LIBOR is below the 7% strike on the reset date, the company would not exercise the cap, of course, and would simply pay the interest under the loan of LIBOR plus 100 basis points. To this, we still need to add the 27 basis points of annualized premium cost. These two scenarios are summarized in this table appearing now. These outcomes under the 7% cap strategy are depicted on the graph appearing now from our worksheet 7% cap hedge shown along with the company's unhedged position to enable a useful comparison. We see clearly that where LIBOR has risen substantially to the right of the graph, the cap has reduced the company's net interest expense versus the unhedged outcome precisely the case that was of concern to the company. 
where LIBOR has remained stable or has fallen towards the left of the graph, the cap premium has increased the company's net interest expense versus the unhedged case. A shame with the benefit of hindsight, but a price the company presumably is willing to pay to achieve peace of mind. Finally, where LIBOR has risen, but only slightly, around here for example, above the cap strike, where it reaches for example 7.1 percent or 7.2 percent. The cap, ignoring its premium, reduces the company's interest expense versus the unhedged case, but not by enough to offset this premium. So again leaves the company worse off than if it had remained unhedged. These are the three classical outcomes, if you will, of using any protective option to hedge a financial exposure. Before continuing, we show on this worksheet shortcut a faster but slightly less accurate method for converting an upfront cap or floor premium into an annualized equivalent, which does not require individual discount factors for each reset date, but only the IRS rate for the maturity and frequency of the cap slash floor in question. On this worksheet, we insert the upfront premium in cell C4, the total number of periods over the life of the cap or floor in cell C6, and the appropriate swap rate in cell C5. Note that the swap must have the same reset frequency as the cap or floor, otherwise you need to perform an interest rate conversion first. Now we open the Excel operator PMT and set rate equal to the swap rate in cell C5 but divided further by the payment frequency per annum. We set NPER equal to the item in cell C6, FV equal to 0, since we are seeking to annuitize an upfront payment into exactly equal periodic payments and wish to avoid altogether a balloon payment at the end. Of course set the premium but with the minus sign first in PV and then hit OK and discover the value in cell C8 of 6.77 basis points quarterly. This is then multiplied by 4 on account of the quarterly frequency in the cell C9 to reveal an annualized premium of 27 basis points once again, the same as before to the nearest basis point. An immediate alternative that presents itself is one involving a cheaper LIBOR cap. Cheaper specifically on account of a more distant strike. Take for example the 5-year cap struck at 8% which costs 58.2 basis points up front or around $582,000 
rounded to the nearest thousand, given the total notional of one hundred million dollars. Our old worksheet annualized premium a little further to the right of the previous table again calculates the annualized equivalent of this premium revealing it this time to be about 13 basis points annually. The two main outcomes can now be summarized by means of this table and run parallel in substance to the ones we saw for the 7% cap but with different absolute levels. These two sets of outcomes are now plotted on the graph appearing here in yellow on this worksheet 8% cap hedge with the black hockey stick showing the outcome under the 7% cap and of course the diagonal showing the original unhedged position. Note the principal advantage of the 8% cap over the 7% cap. When the option expires unused over on the left the company has wasted less of its money on the premium and so is ahead overall. Although in both instances remaining unhedged would have been the best decision of all. Over on the right we see the two horizontals illustrating the benefit of caps with the two alternative strikes but with different net outcomes given the different strikes and upfront premiums. Make sure you are entirely comfortable with all figures you see on this diagram before proceeding further in this module. We could, of course, continue to analyze strategies involving yet more caps with increasingly lower or higher strikes, but we think by now you understand the pros and cons of these types of strategies, so we bring this chapter and part one of this module to a close before introducing more sophisticated strategies in the upcoming part two.